Hello? Maybe not? Hello? Hello? Ah, okay. So, uh, welcome to the session on order revealing and searchable encryption. Uh, my name is Florian Kirschbaum, and it's my pleasure uh, to introduce David from uh, the US, US Naval Academy to give the first talk. Hi, everybody. Good morning. Uh, I'm Dan Roach at the US Naval Academy, so thanks, everybody, for waking up and uh, coming today. And uh, yeah, so this is some joint work with uh, colleagues, one of my colleagues at the, at the U.S. Naval Academy and Daniel Apon, who's a PhD student at the University of Maryland, who you should all hire when he graduates soon, and uh, Arkady, who's at MIT Lincoln Labs, and who's also here. So the problem that we're going to be looking at, and I think the kind of the theme of a lot of the work that you're going to see in this uh, session is about how to encrypt a database or how to encrypt a database index. So the, I don't think I have to motivate you too much that uh, people want to store databases or information in the cloud on some remote servers, and those servers get hacked all the time. Uh, I was looking for some motivating examples and even just looking at voting record databases last year. If you are registered to vote in the US or Mexico or the Philippines, then we're pretty sure that your voter registration information um, was hacked because of some, somebody left a door open to their database and somebody got into it. Uh, so we could, we could chastise the people who run those databases, and we should, for not using any proper uh, authentication mechanisms to keep people out. But another great idea is to not store um, unencrypted uh, valuable or sensitive information on those systems in the first place. And so that's what we're going to be talking about. So how can we encrypt our data? How can we secure it while it's sitting in the database without sacrificing the performance that we need? And there's kind of three dimensions of how we might want to make a decision of the way that you want to do this. Uh, obviously, you might have some certain features in mind. What kind of queries are you going to be running? How big is your database, et cetera? Uh, and then there's the standard trade-off between performance and privacy. Uh, how, how fast do you need it to be? And uh, what are you willing to give up in terms of leakage? And so all three of these things are going to be some kind of space that you have to search for to, to think about what algorithms, what implementations do I want to use in my database and in my encrypted database. And what I'm going to do is focus on one kind of use case, so one thing in terms of the features, and then look at trade-offs between performance and privacy in that, in that space. So our target features, so the kind of database that I want to think about is one where there's a lot of insertions and relatively few uh, lookups or range queries. And why range queries is because they're kind of difficult to, to get going, and uh, they're also very useful. And it's also more general than just straight lookup. So if you do a range query from something to itself, then that's a regular lookup, or you can get everything in the range. And this is some kind of a big data scenario where you can imagine maybe there's a lot of sensors that are collecting data or some log or something like that that's inserting a lot of records into the database. And then later on, you want to do some processing of that, some queries over it. And so the, the, one of the main tricks or things that we're going to do to give you a little preview is that we're going to do very little work, almost no work at insertion time, and do all the work for sorting and everything at query time. And that's kind of the idea. So if you want to have a data set in your mind, you can think about a salary database where you have uh, names and salaries, and you want to ask, answer questions like, what are the names of all the people that make between $100,000 and $110,000? Um, so that would be the kind of thing we're looking about. And the reason I mention that is because we happen to have a great uh, salary database from the state of California, so we know how much money all of the uh, neuroscience professors make at Berkeley. And so what I'm going to do is talk about what's out there right now. Actually, I'm going to spend quite a lot of time doing this. It's a foolhardy and stupid thing for me to do, uh, standing here in front of most of the people that have done this other work, uh, to tell them about how they're... Uh, what their work looks like, so I'm going to do that anyway. Um, just to give us a general idea of what's the space of solutions here and what are the options that we have. And then I'm going to talk about what we did, which is called 
Pope, which provides kind of a new compromise. Pope is not going to be the fastest solution to this problem. It's not going to be the most secure solution to this problem, but it is going to be a bit faster and a bit more secure than some of the existing solutions. That's, that was our goal. And then we'll look at some evaluation of it. So here's the space that I'm thinking about here. So you can think of this as two dimensions. This is going to be kind of a, uh, you know, don't look too carefully. It's not really a detailed plot, but we're going to try to look at the space of existing solutions here in terms of their performance they give and the privacy um, that they provide. So really, we would love to be up in this upper right corner um, with perfect privacy, not leaking anything, and with amazing performance, being able to store billions of things and trillions of things in a database with no problem. And we're not going to get there. So don't, don't hope for that. And what we're going to see is some kind of compromise between them, and we want to think about uh, what kind of compromise we want. So I'll go through these different options that we have, and then we'll see where Pope fits in. So one option that's kind of trivial, and hopefully you believe that this can be done, is you could just not encrypt the keys. Uh, you could trivially encrypt the values, though. So you, uh, with using any existing database implementation, you could encrypt the keys, like in the salary example, encrypt the, um, sorry, encrypt the values only. So in the salary example, encrypt the names of people, but not encrypt the salary. So if somebody were to hack into the system, they would see all of the actual salaries, but uh, then just cipher text of maybe symmetric encryptions of people's names. So that's uh, the worst option that leaks the entirety of all the keys, and there's, um, that's not good for a lot of situations. And of course, even if you're thinking of encrypting the values, we know a lot of examples where you can do some kind of cross-validation or there's other columns in your database and do some other correlation. So this, this is bad in terms of privacy, but it's obviously going to give you the best performance. OPE was introduced in the past decade uh, with the main goal of achieving really that same level of performance, being able to use your same existing database and everything else without changing it, uh, but being able to have some privacy in those keys. So the, the idea, the dream of OPE is that we can encrypt in such a way that uh, the ciphertext comparison matches one-to-one -one with plain text comparison. So that way, if I want to do a range search, I just encrypt the two endpoints of my range and then do a regular range search on the backend database, and I don't have to change that at all. Sounds wonderful, uh, and there's a lot of great solutions. It's used in a lot of places, um, and unfortunately, it's also been attacked a lot. So the unfortunate thing about this is there's even provable lower bounds in some uh, restrictions of uh, non-interactive schemes and deterministic schemes that say that half of the plain text, plain text bits of the keys are actually going to be leaked uh, no matter what you do in this situation. So, for example, the salary database, you might not know that I make $110,358, but you know that I make $110,000 and change. Um, so that's like half of the plain text bits. That's probably enough information that makes me uncomfortable. Um, and so that's, so that's, that's what goes on here, um, but you get very good performance because you can, you can use the same existing database backend. So both of these are, are in the big O of one, like constant time um, range, where the amount of extra work and the amount of communication that you have to do between the client and the server is just a constant, um, you know, yeah, just big O of one, assuming that your sizes of what you're inserting is, is constant. So a solution to the privacy issues with OPE is some re more recently proposed schemes, which I term interactive OPE. And with all these, I'm kind of grouping together more things than I really should, so um, don't be too upset by that uh, if you don't think all these things fit that category perfectly, because they don't. But uh, the idea of these is that we're going to really get the promise of OPE, which is to only reveal the order and not anything else about the plain text. But what you pay is, unfortunately, you, there's a price and there's a performance penalty. So these schemes are, end up being some kind of something like log n time um, to, to do range queries and to do insertions. And you get a noticeable drop in practical performance instead of being able to store in the um, kind of billions of records, you can store maybe millions of records in this way and have it still be pretty efficient. Uh, then something that's not really talked about a lot in this space, but I think is worth mentioning, is ORAM. So if you're familiar with ORAMs, it stands for Oblivious RAM. The idea is that you hide the access pattern to data, and you, you encrypt everything, including well, what things you're accessing. So this provides even more security than these interactive OPE schemes, because you only leak the size. Uh, that's all that 
that ORAM reveals is the overall uh, number of operations or what you're doing. And you could use some oblivious data structures, which is some recent work um, that was started a few years ago. And uh, myself and two co-authors have a paper on this from Oakland this year of an oblivious, uh, oblivious B tree of sort that you could use to do range searches. So that's another option. But again, you're going to get another performance penalty. This is like polylogarithmic in N now. So it's getting slower and slower. And if you want the, the most secure thing uh, trivially, you could just encrypt your entire database, download the whole thing, change the little piece, and, and upload it back every time you do an operation. We can laugh at that as being stupid, but actually, it's probably better than ORAM in some reasonable range. Um, and so that's, that's something that we should think about. So this is kind of the, the scope of what we have to work with um, before my work. And what uh, Pope, where Pope is going to fit in, Pope is partial order preserving encoding. And where it fits in is something a little bit more uh, secure, so leaking a little bit less and a bit better performance than previous interactive OPE schemes. So that's kind of where it fits in in this picture. And the hope is, to my knowledge, mostly it's these two options here that get used a lot in practice. So one of the reasons why OPE has been attacked so much is because it's really useful. And a lot of people want, want to be using that, and it has been deployed in a lot of uh, commercial systems, uh, because you get that great performance and you get some privacy from it. But the privacy you get from it is not great. And so my hope is that um, with Pope, that we can get a similar level of performance, not going to be quite as good as that, um, but a similar level of performance that might, th might make this more commercially relevant, um, while also providing a decent amount of security on those keys. So that's my setup, and now let's see how it actually works. So here's a um, bunch of text describing it, and then we'll see some examples in a moment. The basic idea behind the Pope is that you have a partially ordered B tree, so it's going to be a B tree. Uh, that's a certain kind of data structure for doing lookups and range searches, but it's only going to be partially ordered. So at every node in this B tree, there's going to be a big unsorted list of ciphertext that the server has no idea what the relative order between them is. And um, what's going to happen is that the ordering is going to happen during query time. So at insertion time, everything just stays unordered and you just add more unordered stuff. And at query time, you partially sort the uh, records that you have in the database so far in order to execute that query uh, and in order to build the structure of your tree. So what, what happens there is that in this scenario that, remember, we're looking at where you have lots of insertions and relatively fewer range queries, you get a nice performance improvement because you don't have to spend an expensive cost of going through a tree or anything at insertion time. OK, so here's the idea. Uh, in my picture here, the server is going to be this big box on the left, because the server has a lot of space. And the client is going to be the little thing on the right, because the whole idea is that the client doesn't have as much space to work with. And we also don't want to store anything persistent at the client. So all that the client is going to have to store is a, a shared symmetric key. Um, and, and so that, that's going to be nice. So there could also be multiple clients, as long as they all share the same symmetric key. So what you do is when you're inserting things at first, you're just inserting them uh, ciphertext into an unsorted root node in this tree. So what you see here is this is the root node of a tree. And the fact that they're in gray is my uh, telling you that they are encrypted. So they're just encrypted using regular uh, symmetric encryption. So the server has no idea, just knows that two ciphertexts have been inserted, doesn't know anything about what they are right now. And if the client does a range query, what we have is that there's a very important parameter in our construction, which is capital L, if you read the paper. Uh, but this parameter is the amount of ciphertext that the client can store at one time. Uh, and, that's, and so if you do a query where the total size of a node is less than that, then it just sends the entire thing back to the client. The client can decrypt and figure out what it fits into its range on its own. Um, and so for this for, uh, example that you're going to be seeing, I have L equals 2. The client can store two things at a time. In reality, it's probably going to be more like 100 or something like that, but um, not, not too big. So if it's below that threshold, then we just send the, everything in that node to the client, and the client figures out on its own. And in this case, the server doesn't learn any ordering information. Life is good. But of course, you're going to insert more and more and more records into your database. Your root node is going to get bigger and bigger. So eventually, that whole node can't fit on the client anymore. And that's the point at which you're going to start to build the B tree. So if you are familiar with B trees, if you remember from your data structures class, uh, 
what you would want to do here is try to pick out the median value or something like that and split the B tree according to that, split the B tree node according to that one so you get balance. Unfortunately, the server can't do that because the server has no idea what the order of those things is, so how would it pick out the median? And the client can't do that either because the client can't fit that whole node in its memory. Uh, for this example, we're saying client memory bound is two. And so the client can't do that either. What the server's gonna do instead is uh, just randomly choose uh, L ciphertext from this node to promote. So it's gonna randomly choose uh, these two. So this happens during a, a range search. Uh, the, the server picks these two ciphertexts at random and sends them to the client and says, this is gonna be what's promoted to my root node. Now the client, of course, can decrypt them and sort those two ciphertexts and sends back their order back to the server. So just of these two, now the server learns the relative order of those. And now in order to complete the B tree, we should have three children of this node. And so for each one of these remaining ciphertexts, the client is gonna tell the server which one of those three children they should belong in. So not all the complete ordering of everything, but just the relative order compared to the entries in that root node. So like it'll send the encryption of 89, the client will decrypt that and say, okay, 89 should go in the rightmost tree. And then it'll send 42, the client says, okay, 42 is between these two unencrypted values, so that should go in the middle tree. So you get this kind of a picture. And these numbers on the top are indicating kind of the server's view of what the ordering is here. The server knows that this ciphertext, whatever it is, is less than this ciphertext. It knows that anything in this node is between the two of them, and anything in here is greater than whatever's there. Uh, but it doesn't know anything about those relative orders uh, within the leaf nodes. And now that that's been done, now the range query can descend to the child node of that. We see that the entire range is less than 41. So the range query can descend down to this node, and now that one's small enough to just send the entire thing to the client and let them figure it out. So what's happened here is we've leaked some of the order, but not the complete order, in order to be able to execute this range query. And we're starting to build up this tree that's gonna make future range queries also be faster. Okay, so what happens? We're gonna do some more insertions. Again, I said that the way this tree works is that every single node, not just the leaf nodes, can have some unsorted buffer of ciphertext that's sitting next to it, uh, which is really where we get our performance and the security from. So it's kind of, a, you can think of it as a lazy method where when you insert, you just encrypt and append that ciphertext to the root node. The server doesn't know anything about the order of those three values. They're only gonna get ordered when you do another range query. So when we do another range query, the first thing you have to do is uh, you have to go through for the, both search paths for both ends of the range. You have to clear out all the buffers of those nodes along the search path. How do we do that? Uh, remember, the client doesn't remember anything about this tree, so the server has to send the ordered part of the root node back to the client, which only has size two, so the client can store it. And now it's going to stream these ciphertexts to the client and say, where does each one go in terms of the three children? So the client uh, responds, and now we are building up our root, our, our B tree, so the unsorted buffer that was there has been now filtered down to the children. And now this uh, range search continues. In this case, it's all gonna be bigger than 55, so we'll descend down to this node. But now you notice that this node is not in our base case situation. It's too big to send that whole node to the client. Again, for this example, we're saying the client size bound is two. So what do we do is we do the same operation as before, is the server will randomly pick two ciphertexts out of this large root node, promote them up to the parent, and split that accordingly. So in this case, I think the way I set it up is that 89 and 57 are gonna be randomly, see I can predict the future. Um, this must be a dual EC random number generator. And uh, they, those get promoted up to the parent, and, and now those get split in the, in the leaf nodes. Okay, and now we will be ready to finish up this range query, except I said before that each one of the sorted parts of the internal nodes of this tree can't have size bigger than whatever the client can store. Because remember, we're gonna send those entire chunks to the client whenever we do another query. So before that can happen, we have to restructure this so that every node has size at most two in my example. Now the good news there is that the server can do it on its own because the server actually knows the relative order of these four ciphertexts, so the server can pick out what's gonna be the median and do any B tree restructuring as it wants. Uh, so this is what's gonna happen there. And finally, the range search goes down to this one leaf node, which is sent to the client, so the client can extract, uh, in this case, the one record that fits in their range. Okay, so this is the idea of our construction. There's some more details, obviously, that I didn't go through, but this is the principle of it. What I want you to, in case you, uh, 
floated away in the last few minutes, come back to us. And what I want you to notice is that we have these large gray parts of the tree that are uh, unsorted, uh, encrypted values that are being uh, stored in the tree, and the server never knows the relative order between those. All the server knows is the order of, uh, well, in this case, these four things and the order of the other ones relative to those. And so the we're going to get a performance benefit from this because there can be large parts, large uh, percentages of the tree that are totally unsorted that you don't have to spend any work, any communication to keep in order if they're not relevant to your range queries. And you get a security benefit from it because the server doesn't learn the complete order of all of your keys. So that's, that's kind of the idea of what we're going to see. And so here's the analysis that we have in terms of the running time. Um, the important thing here is that it's big O of 1 with a big asterisk. So it's, it's big O of 1, it's constant time, the best we could do if uh, you believe in amortized analysis and if you uh, satisfy the conditions that I have here, which is saying that the client has a reasonable amount of memory, um, so n to, the, to some constant amount of memory, and that there's not too many range queries, so the number of range queries should be less than n divided by l. What does this mean in practice? Um, I see Ian squinting at, at those formulas, uh, so I want to put you out of, out of your trouble. So if you think about if we had, say, a million entries in the database, um, reasonable values for range queries, and actually this is the, this is the examples that we did, would be like square root of n number of range queries. So if you have a million entries, you can maybe do up to like 1,000 range queries, um, and your client would need to be able to store something like 100 uh, things at one time. So not too unreasonable, I think, for the kind of scenario that we're looking at. And in that case, the average cost per operation is going to be constant. Uh, and that's in terms of the amount of communication and the actual computational cost as well. And the reason why it's amortized is because you can think of you had, if you had a million insertions all at once and then one range query, what's going to happen in that one range query is that all of those ciphertexts have to be streamed to the client in order to sort the B tree a bit uh, in order to execute that one range query. So you'll have uh, one, a cost of one transfer for a long, long time, and then you'll have a big cost for that first range query. Of course, future range queries would be less expensive, uh, but what we proved is that in expectation, because it's a randomized algorithm, uh, the average cost, uh, the amortized cost per operation is, is still constant. And in fact, in practice, in our experiments, it was 10. So it's a, on average of 10 ciphertext transferred per operation. Um, so I think that's, that's pretty good. And we're happy about that. And here's uh, some uh, graphs showing our implementation and the, what happens in practice. So we tested a couple different things. Our implementation is in Python, so it's probably not as fast as it could be. But what you see here is the number of operations per second, so higher is better, and uh, compared to the number of entries in the database. And uh, what the different lines in this graph, this is all with Pope, uh, but with different patterns of the range query. So the best case for us is that you're doing the same range query over and over and over again. Why is that the best situation is that it, and even if you do some insert in between, uh, your split points of wherever you broke up all the nodes for some previous range query, you're going to get to reuse that work that you did most effectively for the next query if it's the same one. Um, so in that case, we have uh, something like 120,000 operations per second for the very large sizes. And if you have random queries or all the, bunch, uh, all the queries are bunched at the end, then you have a little bit lower performance there. Um, and and that's, what, that's what we see here. But the important thing is that it's, it's a constant. So as the size is increasing, the performance actually goes up a little bit and then plateaus. That's good. That's what we expect to see. What you would see in um, these other schemes that have like log n or log squared n type performance is that that performance would go down as the uh, database size gets larger and larger. So this is indicating that we have constant time. And then again, that's why I, I'm, my hope is that Pope might be in the realm of what's useful practically based on the fact that we have this constant time performance, at least for this kind of a scenario. All right, and finally, uh, there is also, uh, we can prove things about the security of Pope. So there's been at least these two uh, very nice definitions of security for OPE in the past. This is the original one, and if you know what these letters all stand for, then I'm sorry um, for you. And, uh, but if you don't, what that means is that uh, the, it doesn't reveal anything other than the order of the plain text, um, and we achieve that. Uh, we also achieve, achieve this stronger one by uh, Florian Kirschbaum from last year, uh, which is um, 
Also, the Fs, I don't remember what all the other things stand for, but I know the F stands for frequency. So this is frequency hiding. So one of the um, big things that was pointed out last year was a problem with OPE is if you have a lot of duplicate keys, then the, the fact that those are duplicated can be revealed, and that can be pretty bad um, in terms of how much it reveals about your database. So we can also uh, use some similar techniques of randomization to protect against that. Although I point out that we can do that without having to have any more than uh, order one client-side storage. So I'm pretty excited about that. And we even go farther than that. Um, so we only actually leak a partial order, hence the name. And the quantification of what's that partial order is that we can say there's a lower bound, so that's a big omega, is a lower bound on the number of incomparable pairs of elements after m operations. Um, so after m queries, there's going to be at least this many pairs of ciphertext that the server still can't tell the relative order between them. And um, that's pretty good. Probably you could make this better. I would like to be able to make this better or prove that that's a lower bound or something. Um, but that's what we have. So thanks again. Thanks to my co-authors uh, for telling me about this problem and uh, working with me on it. And it's been really great. Thanks to our founders uh, for paying for us to do things. And yeah, uh, thanks for your time. Um, please state your name and affiliation. Jed Liu, Univer uh, Cornell University. Um, this is really interesting work. Um, so my question is, I'm wondering what your adversary model is, and in particular, um, your leaf node splitting protocol uh, has the client reviewing, s revealing some uh, ordering information between keys to the server. I'm wondering how you prevent the server from leveraging this to gain more information about the ordering of keys than it should. Yeah, great question. Thank you. Um, so in the, if you want the most basic situation, you could say that the server is honest but curious, and then everything is fine. Uh, but if you want to think about a malicious server, we do provide some protection in that case as well. And the way that you do that is you enforce, so the client is the same one that's doing queries and presumably knows how many insertions there were. So it's just enforcing the client. Um, maybe the server's sending some other ciphertext to be compared to the client, but the client keeps a track of how many it's done. And so we have some bounds on how many comparisons will need to be done in uh, the expected worst case. So the client just refuses to give more answers after that time. And the lower bound that we have in terms of the partial um, order leak, that's only based on no matter what ciphertext the server might have thrown for the client to compare, that bound still holds. So we get all those security properties just by the client essentially keeping track of how many requests it's got from the server. Great, thanks. Um, thank you for the well-motivated work. I'm June Fulka from NET Corporation. And I have a question about the insertion operation. I think if you keep uh, inserting data at a certain point in time, you have to rebalance the tree of index. Uh, how do you do that? Uh, and how, what kind, how, how much in, impact does it have, such operation? Um, so I'm not sure I got every part of your question, but I think you were asking about um, if you insert a lot that you get an unbounded size of yeah. the root node in your tree. Yeah. Yeah, and that yeah. actually, that's great. So that's, a, that's exactly right, and we love that because uh, the server has the memory to store it. And again, that's the whole point of the Pope is that you have these big portions of the tree which are unsorted, um, unbounded, and that saves you computation time and doesn't reveal anything about their relative order. So that's right, and it's a good thing. Yes, but if you keep uh, inserting data in the small area, I think the uh, one of nodes get uh, huge, and you have to divided in, into many pieces, and, but you don't have data at the server how you divide them, and I want to know how to do that. Um, yeah, so again, I, maybe we can talk more maybe. afterwards, but uh, yeah, it's the server, we assume that the server can store all the data you're sending to it. That's uh, the underlying assumption here. And uh, the server can organize that however it wants. Thank you. Uh, also, uh, in the interest of time, I have to say, unfortunately, I see very many people lining up, and I, uh, uh, I'm sorry, uh, you're Paul, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you will have to take it offline. I, only one more question. I, I apologize. In, in the interest of time. But uh, I think you both you guys know each other probably anyway, so, so okay. please go ahead. Thanks. Kevin Louie, Facebook. Um, so I had a question about, so you, you mentioned in the scenario where you have um, 
multiple clients who share a secret key and are storing on the server. Um, it sounds like in that case, it might be useful if like, things could be done in parallel, I guess. Do you have any, um, can, can you talk about like, if, um, if you can do parallel insertions or parallel range queries? With this um, so yes to parallel insertions would be kind of trivial because, again, the insertion operation is trivial. You're just appending to the root node. Parallel range queries, uh, maybe if we thought about it, but I have no idea. So I would, if I wanted to implement this to work in parallel, it's a great idea. I would probably lock the entire database um, during a range query operation because that's when the tree is being restructured. Thanks. Right. Thank you, thank you. Yep. Danielle. Thank you.